get rid of the right so good morning as i say i'm full of painkillers but your host for the day jenny milne but actually you guys are all the hosts because it is the open cafe and um, as usual uh, for those of the, you that are familiar please use the chat box and um, it is your friend and i know over the last 18 months it's provided a lot of information and networking as well for people and um, keep on mute just now and then it will really be a free for all but we've got quite a lot of subject matters to get through today and um, which i'm looking forward to um, for those of you that didn't manage to get to the gathering, uh, the big announcement we've got is that we have um, some funding from Smarter Choices, Smarter Places, uh, which is for the next 12 months. And we will share with you in more detail what that actually involves. Uh, but we are going to be and are actively going to start as of this week, recruiting for two small part time positions um, to help us out. We've also got the Charter Institute of Logistics and Transport that have joined us as a partner and the routing company and 42. And for those that have not been before, we really are about sharing, being very practical, providing evidence, providing help and uh, providing a bit of a voice and giving us all that feeling of coming together um, when we're quite often sat in rural parts of the world. Um, and I say world because Martin may be in Germany and uh, Matt in sunnier climates in Gran Canaria, but we often have Japan, Australia, uh, Denmark, Finland, etc. Cake. It's called a BYOC. It's bring your own cake. And I can't necessarily see it just now, but that is my cake just now that was handmade by my son and it's a lemon tart. So in usual fashion, a quick, quick see who's got what in front of them today. Um, I can't see all of you at the same time, so uh, I will just flick through. Uh, Alex has got something. Martin's got something. Is it any healthy stuff? Jane's eating something. Can't quite see what it is. Is it bread, Jane? It's a pear because my husband says I'm putting on weight. <laughs> and Alistair's being very, very healthy by having a bottle of water. Alistair, that's just, you need something more unhealthy. Anybody else got something there? Do I see Amelia and Greg have something or not? No? I, I was, was going to say, I don't, I don't have it right now, but this is what I'm going to go get later, is uh, what I'm holding up to the screen. Oh, very nice. Oh, amazing. We, we cheated and <laughs> we just went for a cooked breakfast. Instead. <laughs> Fine, fantastic. David, if you've never been to the cafe before, there's an expectation to do a bit of home cooking. And I can't quite see my friends down in the Midlands Connect, but um, there's usually a fresh loaf of bread that comes out of the oven as well. So we are a cafe, so the idea is to eat cake and coffee, and Ronald's already got his cup of tea. So uh, my house has been rather busy this week because I've not been able to cook. My 11-year-old son has taken to doing all the cooking, so he made me a lemon tart. Not going to complain. So um, first things first, thanks very much for those that are putting bits and pieces in the chat. Alex will monitor it, but please introduce yourself. And th there are some familiar faces and some new faces, which is great. Um, I'll ramble through, for those that weren't at the gathering, that didn't want, they couldn't make it, we have put these sessions together as sort of like mini podcasts. They're not official podcasts, but mini 45 minute sessions so you can commute to work, go for a walk, whatever it may be, have a listen to the sessions. But thank you very much for everybody that took part. And it was really, really well attended. Uh, and we had lots of great conversations and lots came out of it. One of the things that we announced is that you need to check your emails. Um, going forward, there will be a combination of this SRITC, Jenny or Alex at ruralmobility.scot. We have a habit of landing in spam at the moment. So just please make sure that you keep an eye out for that in your safe, safe boxes. Um, the Smarter Choices, Smarter Places funding, as I say, we're recruiting two people and <clears throat> it will be alive on the website later today, hopefully, if not tonight. Um, but we'll circulate it out. Just due to due diligence, we've got a few people in mind that have been approached and have approached us, but we just need to make sure we tick all the right boxes. Um, we're looking for somebody to help Alex out with the marketing side of things. We're not looking for big hours here. It's four, six, eight hours a week, something like that. And um, we're also looking for somebody to come and help me out behind the scenes as well. So there'll be a lot of crossover between the two, but again, 
48 hours. Um, it will not be an employed position because we're not going down the PAYE side of things. You will be self-employed um, just to make life easier and just to also make sure that the money that we get can go that bit further uh, rather than necessarily giving it to the tax man, which I'm sure you all agree is what we want to make sure that we do. So um, if you want more information on that, just put something in the chat just now or Alex might be able to um, share some of the links uh, for where it will be advertised. Um, the closing date for that is going to be the 10th of November and as the uh, funding will run from the beginning of November until November next year, obviously, it's quite a quite turnaround um, and hopefully people will be in position by the end of this month. As a result of the gathering, uh, we did a couple of polls and one of the polls was about where we're going to have the gathering next year and it is going to be in the Aviemore area was what the conclusion was. So it's going to be the end of September. Uh, in the Aviemore area, as I say, because we're more likely to use a local hotel rather than a big establishment um, or a local hall. Um, and what we're looking at doing is making this an experience. So if it's on a Thursday, for example, that maybe on the Wednesday we do some site visits to see relevant um, rural transport projects. You also get the opportunity to use the High Trans Mass app um, and also have an informal, informal dinner the night before. And then on the day of the gathering, we will also have in the evening an awards night and those are requests for a Kaylee. So we're going to make it a real big experience and a real reason for people to travel, not just only within Scotland, but elsewhere within the UK and overseas and make it, as always, very practical so that you can learn from the two days that you're away. We'll also be circulating shortly the 2022 cafes. We are keeping them online and there is an array of subject matters. Uh, ranging from school buses, decarbonisation, um, oh, we've actually got too many subject matters to try and squeeze into monthly cafes at the moment, which is fantastic. Um, so we'll, we'll share with that with you shortly, um, but it will stay on the Friday of the last month. Now, before I throw, throw, throw the floor open, um, I just want to say the following people have sort of been shortlisted for contributing today. Um, Jim, I know you're here somewhere from Loch Lomond. Um, Jim's going to share with you some of his experiences, his thoughts. He's been put on the, on the back foot just now, but he sent me a lovely email talking about the challenges and opportunities he's had um, and just looking for some suggestions, help um, and ideas of, of going forward of what's happening in Loch Lomond. Martin uh, in Germany is going to discuss a few projects that he knows of that are combining goods and people because uh, obviously I've discussed this before and we've discussed it at the gathering about how we can maybe look at demand response transport in particular, not just um, using uh, transporting people around, but also the idea of moving goods with that as well, which I'll come back to that one in more. Um, I've also got Donald here um, who has said he's from Kalin. I think we should have Murray Carshare share here as well. Um, and I'd also like David Kelly to introduce himself as a, a newbie to SRITC um, as he's just taken over from Rachel Murphy at the Community Transport Association. And then we have the guys from Scoot and anybody else that wants to speak can speak. But those are the themes that we want to run quickly through today. Um, now, sorry for the following, okay? I, this is a rant and a moan, but also a very practical solution, okay? There's a few people that know what I'm about to say, um, but this week, because I've been out of action, I can't drive. And we have a new DRT system in the area that I'm sitting in at the moment. And can I say I am a DRT virgin no more? And I know we have some DRT suppliers here. Um, they may like to learn from my experience because I've done this as a user as well as somebody who obviously knows a thing or two. And it's been a real eye opener, real eye opener. So I want to just ask here who has actually used the new on demand systems that seem to be popping up around the world. Any, put your physical hand up or your real hand up. Anybody actually used one? I can see Greg's hand. I think you've muted yourself. There you go. You hear me? <laughs> thank you. I don't know how I muted myself. Anyway, thank you, Greg, for putting your hands up. I don't know. Um, how you all feel about demand response. Uh, Donald, you raised your hand as well. Fab, thank you very much. Um, but it wasn't quite what I was expecting. It started off as a door-to-door -door 
bit, which doesn't really help me when I don't have, uh, sorry, a bus stop to bus stop, doesn't really help me when my bus stop location is two and a half miles away. So um, I'm not gonna be too blunt with it, but this is suffice to say, when I opened up the app, okay, this is what I was confronted with. And I've had to do two screenshots here because if you look at the one on the left, that's what I saw originally. And I went, I am trying to go with some total of eight miles. And they're telling me to walk 100 minutes or 109 minutes along a main road to get a bus to then get 12 minutes, 12 minute walk. It was after the fourth attempt of using this app that I then discovered, because I'm on an SE and I'm not on a massive phone, uh, Apple SE, that there was a bottom box at the very bottom that said order. Okay, now I think this screen says a thousand things. The main thing it says to me is that we shouldn't be telling people in rural areas to be walking 100 minutes to go and get a bus. Um, and I don't know about anybody else, but I think that's really quite wrong. Um, I could go on and on about the issues. I have actually been on the bus three times, four times now. Um, to go to various physio appointments, etc. The bus was fantastic, it was clean, the drivers were great. The problem actually is the way it's been set up and the technology that's behind it. Um, so I just wanted to share with you my experiences on DRT and I wanted to ask people out there what their experiences are. But I'd like to think that going forward, we won't be asked to walk 128 minutes to do what really in essence is a 15 minute journey. So that's the practical side of things. Um, over to you on the floor to see what you think and what your uh, experiences are of DRT. I think somebody had, who had their hand up? Donald, did you have your hand up as DRT? Martin, do you want to put your hand up? Somebody? Yeah. Donald? Hi. Um, yeah, I can't answer for myself, but my wife has used uh, DRT so she can talk. Hello. Hi, Anne. Anne. Nice to see you. Uh, that'll yeah. be, I'm, I'm Alicia Don's wife and I have visual impairment, so uh, I know a bit about DRT. Um, here in Killing, um, we now have to book it through a booking system with Stirling Council, um, but it, it's not, we're not told to walk anywhere, it is a door to door service. So, um, and I have used it, I've used it quite a lot, and it's quite simple once you get into the system it's getting into the system that seems to be the problem i mean we've had some a chat just recently that uh, because we cover tyndrum to strathire which is a massive area and tyndrum and Crean larry do not have any public transport at all so this means that to get a bus anywhere, well, uh, down to Stirling, which is, um, or Fourth Valley, which is our hospital, they have to come into Killing. So, um, you know, it's it's a, a case really, and we had, I, I, sorry, I was going to say, we had a gentleman who needed to book um, DRT, but unfortunately he left it a bit too late um, because you have to register with Stirling Council and then what they do is they you you go online, you book your um, travel, and they don't get in touch with you until after three o'clock the day before you're traveling to tell you whether they can do the journey or not. And that, of course, is uh, sometimes like if they say no, you're stuck. I have so, but, but I, I have can, used it. Yeah, I can even use I the app. The app doesn't work for me. Not, the app for me no, no, I don't doesn't use work. Um, and so I have to use the telephone and the telephone, they do, I can book um, and I can book then for tomorrow or today and I'm not having to wait yeah. like you, but um, I then don't get any communication until 15 minutes before it's meant to arrive by text to tell oh, me that wow. it's actually going. Whereas I quite like a bit of reassurance to say that I've booked it by phone and that there's yeah. an email or something to say the bus is actually going to turn up. Yeah, well, that's that's the problem here. That's, but it is, you know, as I say, three o'clock the, the day before. So at least you've maybe got a chance to get somebody else to take you. But if you're in systems, it seems fine. I mean, I used to just, in fact, the days that I used it more recently was I just used to ring up and say, can I do this? Can I do that? And uh, this, the, my DRT was actually taking me from Tyndrum into, no, sorry, from Killing, where we live, into Tyndrum for an hour. 
and he would come back and pick me up after the hour and bring me back to filling. You've also so had I mean, a service. A good service. You've had a service before. I've had no service in 20 years living here. So I've got quite excited about the fact that I could go out <laughs> for a drink or a meal or go and get shopping or go to physio, etc. Um, a few here know that I've had problems with not only the app, but also the location. They've said they'll use the postcode to work out my stop, which obviously in a rural area, postcode covers a really large area. There was meant to be a virtual stop at the top of my road, which was put into place, but they're now not using that. They're using something else. And I have to walk 300, 400 yards along a very busy road and I'm having to use a walking stick. Not really what I was expecting at all. Oh, then who we're probably runs your deal? Who I'm not runs gonna, your deal? I'm not going to say at the moment because it's unfair to, to be um, to be negative. <laughs> but I, 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 will, I can email you afterwards um, and I have brought this to attention of various individuals who have just told me to uh, un uh, uninstall and reinstall my app four times to see if that works and obviously I don't know what I'm talking about so I, I, I think this experience that we all talk about DRT and what a fantastic change it will make and I know we've got some suppliers here and um, will make and I don't disagree I think it makes a big difference Yesterday, I was asked by a lady in her 90s why I was on the bus because I didn't look like somebody that uh, didn't have a driving license. And I said, well, to be honest, I want to be able to use the service, not have to worry about parking. I'm injured. Um, and also the price of fuel in my area is now pound fifty six, And the journey for going round a uh, 17, 18 mile journey was going to cost, three, cost me £3.90 and to take a child was £1.50 for the same journey. That's cheaper than using our, uh, our car. So I really wanted to share this experience because I think it's a great thing for certain areas and rural areas. And I would encourage you to go and find somewhere that's got DRT to try it if you haven't already tried it. And I know Martin had his hand up and I've overspoken because I get passionate about these things. Sorry, Martin. I, can I just finish one, one thing? Yep, is, yep. I think ours is run by Stirling Council and people that are, have a bus pass don't have to pay for DRT either. Yep, yep, so yep. because it's run by Stirling Council, mm. they get their journeys just like they would on a bus. Right, that's me finished. Martin. Hi, yeah. Um, I just, uh, thanks for this impression. I just asked my colleague who is monitoring, who is running the uh travel line equivalent here uh how, how much uh, walking distance the, the the system normally accepts and he said uh, 15 minutes so you you wouldn't have risk got gotten any uh, travel information probably if you had if you had that level of service <laughs> if you used our system um so yeah there are many uh what you said so far uh, uh Kind of, kind of confirms that there are many things you can, many things you can do wrong, or you can do in a complicated way when you set up a DRT system. So, uh, and uh, modern technology is no a cure to that necessarily. I would say. Yeah. Um, we can have a separate, uh, separate conference on DRT. Uh, yeah. I'm going to bring all these experiences. I guess. I know there's a few suppliers here, so I'm going to ask uh, Amelia and Greg. Uh, Matt, and I'm trying to see if there's uh, the other suspect I was looking for. Alden, if you would, the three of you would like to contribute on this. Yeah, I think, um, well, there's some really simple wins that they could do. Firstly, they could use what three words. So what three words is an SDK that you can easily put into the app. So what three words for anyone that doesn't know has split up the world into three meter squares and assign three, uh, three words to every single square. So you can define a three meter square anywhere in the world with these three words. So you can link them into an app and there's a website that you can go to so you can find where your house sits. And so any DRT transportation um, could actually link in with what three words. It's used a lot by emergency services where they have to go to rural locations, um, but it's now extending into the commercial world. And as for not getting a text after you confirm your booking, I mean, even hairdressers now give you a text once you've booked your hair. So I don't know why they can't do that bit. And that's really simple. Um, and certainly putting in parameters, like Martin says, you, you should just be able to put a parameter in that, right, if it's over 15 minutes, then don't give a result because otherwise it just uh, frustrates people because to telling you to walk two hours the wrong direction on an eight mile journey that would only take you well take you probably two hours to walk it but even so it just seems a bit bizarre 
it does though highlight the problem of rural transport in very clear, concise picture. Uh, do the other two of you wish to contribute? And I'm not wanting you to be like bad mouthing opposition. It's not about that. It's more about what we can do to make DRT what we need it to be, because we all know what it should be as users. Yeah, I don't mind jumping in a little bit. I think it's, um, and I guess rather than bashing or defending, maybe just context, is I think it's really interesting that, um, it also depends on what you want from a service like drt is a very broad like umbrella term um in terms of what expectations are so as you said there jenny like um the virtual bus stop model doesn't really work very well within the more uh, rural areas so it might actually benefit from a point-to-point -point system um but again it kind of depends on what the scope is when you're setting that up as a council or as a provider um, I think in some occasions the providers are limited by the um, by the desires of the people of the governmental agency that they're working with, and then also by updating people's kind of perspectives on on DRT. Um, I know one of the things that you and I spoke about was having a a window for pickup. So saying could be twenty minutes late, could be five ten minutes early, is that's fairly like standard for DRT because effectively what you're hoping to do is fit in additional bookings in that time, um, which may make things a bit later or a bit earlier. So I think there's- yeah. Yeah, my, experience, there's my, my experience was I had an appointment at three o'clock yesterday. So I thought I'll book it because it's 10 minutes away. I'll book it at half past two. So there's a delay to it. At least I'm going to get there. And then unfolded on the telephone a uh, conversation that you need to book it at 20 past two. And I said, why 20 past two? She said, you need to book in the fact that it could be 20 minutes late. And I said, well, I booked that in by saying half past two. So I was like, the information isn't there. It won't turn up early, but it could turn up to 20 minutes late. And I am like going, we need to be able to make that information available to people so they can build it in that you've got to make that 20 minutes extra over and above what you thought there might be as a delay. Um, I'm nipping in. Um, shall we go to Wilson, Alden Wilson? Yes, I, I would say more around, um, I'm happy with what three words, um, as the person said before, but also read time tracking, tracking I would suggest as well. Um, I think that will help, as you said there, about your anxiety about knowing the beat is on its way. I can't even see that on the app. It's not working, so I can't see the... And apparently it's my fault, but it's not just me. There's other people in the area, but I'm going to move on. But all I'll say is it's been an experience and I will keep you updated. But that's what I wanted to contribute today to the conversation. But I'm going to throw back to Martin because we are talking about DRT. And um, in Germany, they are looking at how to bring together the idea of goods. And I know uh, Amelia and Greg have looked at this as well. The idea of goods and people on the same service um yeah there are some people who are looking at it at the moment yes uh, you're right uh, as i already told you um unfortunately uh at, at the moment from what i know uh there is um one such service in northeastern germany uh, close to the polish border which has been working for uh, several uh, for several years um and i can tell you a bit more about that in a moment um, the other ones unfortunately they are kind of announcements of trial schemes and uh, uh research uh, projects and uh, very, uh, such initiatives which haven't yet uh, started there are a few um well, i would say like three or four at least in, across germany that have been announced uh, over the last like uh, year or so. Um, but from what I know, uh, none of them has started yet, unfortunately. I would be interested to know about, to know more about them, but uh, we haven't uh, been like directly in my region, we haven't been like directly involved in any of these and uh, haven't been in, approached by any uh, initiative uh, uh, who had similar ideas. So um, given lots of other tasks under my desk, I haven't really found much time to put, uh, to research these things. Um, what I can tell you is that I think uh, the, uh, the the service that has been working, it's called the combi bus, like a combination uh, combined uh, transport bus, and uh, it has been, I think it also came out of a um, research and innovation uh, project, and it is operating in the Okamark, which is a very low density region, one of the lowest density parts of Germany in uh, um, in Brandenburg, uh, close to the Polish border, I think they have uh, population densities of like 
20, 30 people per square kilometers, which is like the, the kind of the lowest level you have in, in Germany. Not as low as uh, some parts of Scottish Highlands, of course, but uh, for our standards, uh, fairly uh, fairly low density and uh, highly aging uh, population and lots of uh, difficulties going around that. And the bus company there has been, uh, they, they, uh, um, they developed uh, a service which uh, uses like normal scheduled bus routes and uh, um, they uh, use on, on these routes, they use uh, high floor coach type vehicles, which uh, have like luggage storage under underneath uh, in the uh, below the seats. So separate luggage compartments and they, uh, I think they, they tried uh, various uh, things and they, in the end they uh, got themselves a set of uh, plastic containers which fit into these uh, um, um, into these luggage compartments or they take uh, like they also carry parcels and uh, prepackaged stuff but they can also use like loose stuff and in, the, in these boxes and uh, they uh, and people can like bring them bring the luggage to uh, bring these things to the buses and the bus will will take them uh, along as long as, as as far as the bus goes evidently i must say uh, i don't really know what uh, exactly they are carrying at the moment and uh, but I, I remember from the past uh, that the service had uh, one of the main difficulties the service had to come up with was uh, uh, to find uh, suitable products and uh, find a market niche a logistics market niche where they could uh, make a meaningful uh, whether the service they could provide was meaningful um, the problem being that uh, many uh, logistics companies like the post office, the uh, courier services, the pharmacies, uh, all, all these uh, logistics companies, the supermarkets, uh, and what have you, they, they have organized their own logistics uh, processes for themselves, and they have their own hubs and spokes and consolidation centers and tours and, and so on and so forth. And it's uh, not, and this is all being, has been optimized uh, on, on that level, so to speak, and uh, it's been kind of difficult for the bus company to to fit make make itself fit into this into this uh, uh, these processes in in any in any way. I think what what they essentially came up with uh, in the end was to carry, I think, uh, luggage from tourists who are making holiday in that area, and uh, uh, to some extent, uh, food stuff from the regional farms and uh, other like producers. There's kind of a lot of agriculture in that area, and uh, they the, those those farms who are not uh, like big enough to carry to to, to have their own trucks and uh, vehicles. They they have the opportunity to use this bus service, and the bus takes it to uh, some place, uh, some some hub in the in that province uh, where it gets I think uh, consolidated and uh, uh, carried to to the to Berlin which is the, the, the big uh, next uh, next big market and uh, so yeah. to, to be sold there more or less the Japanese are doing that model uh, with uh, fork, mm. uh, farm fork uh, to, mm. to paint type idea and mm. in uh, February the cafe that we're running in February is with the organization UITP um, and mm -hmm. they will have their report that Martin will probably know about as well that's getting published before Christmas. But they're going to be bringing along some of their examples of the the, the combined goods and people options that they've discovered in rural areas. So okay. that, that will be February. Um, oh, yeah. but I'm going to put Greg and, Greg and Amelia on the spot because they have something that involves errands which is a nice way of putting it because we all run errands, don't we? And then mm -hmm. once we've spoken about this, I'm going to go to Jim and he can tell us about Loft Lomond. Greg, Amelia. Yeah, so um, basically Scoop was originally an app that was for younger people to almost create like an Uber network for themselves and their friends. And it had security in it in as much as you could only share journeys with people that had your mobile number in their handsets and vice versa. So in other words, they were close friends. Um, obviously lockdown happened and being a mobility app in lockdown was not the best thing. So we applied to Innovate UK for a competition about how your company could potentially pivot or add in a feature and help during COVID. So we introduced a feature called Errands and basically it uses the network and it enabled people to ask for uh, picking up either a prescription from a pharmacy or picking up your click and collect shopping because we know what happened in COVID that all the slots of delivery slots for shopping disappeared. 
And quite often you couldn't get a slot for about a week and a half, which if you were self-isolating at the time became a massive problem that you had to actually go and ask for help. So errands was this feature whereby you could ask for that help and it would be sent out to um, up to 10 people at once. So you could send it to an individual or you could send it to 10 people and it doesn't put people so much on the spot. So as soon as one person looked at it and said, oh yes, I can do that. The others were identified that someone had picked up the task and then the individual person that requested it was also told, right, this person is delivering it for you. And the, the requestor could put that they needed it within the next two hours, if it was like picking up for a delivery slot from a supermarket, or by end of day. Um, so in other words, if that person was traveling past the pharmacy, for example, and they could pop in and get it. Um, it was quite well, well, it was very well received. And we undertook, I think it was like two and a half thousand tasks um, over a period of about six months. And um, what it did as well was it notified people when the task was started because it navigated the person who was undertaking the task to where it had to be picked up from and where delivered to. And the person who had ordered it and their app would see that person moving um, where they were located. Um, and it also became good from the point of view of you could actually arrange an errand on behalf of someone else. So it didn't have to be delivered to you. Um, so my parents were 100 miles away and I could arrange an errand to be completed on behalf of them um, by one of my friends who lives still, still down in the area. Um, and it was very well received. And, and we've sort of now focused back on the um, lift sharing carpooling piece with offsetting carbon. Um, and uh, but errands is in the background of the app as a feature that's still there today. And I do believe that it could be utilized to better effect. So you could look to merge errands with people sharing journeys as well. And um, we're looking at how we how we can do it, whether it's on demand or whether you flag it almost like um, on a Facebook page saying, oh, tonight I'm traveling back home and this is my journey. And someone could then say, oh, can you drop off this on the way or pick this up on the way, et cetera. So we think there's an interesting opportunity there that we're, we're sort of exploring. Um, but the, the app's called Scoot. You can download it in iOS and Google and um, yeah, have a play with it. And you know, any comments we do listen to, it's not perfect. Never will be perfect. There's no such thing as perfect tech, um, but hopefully it does real time mapping a bit better than what the TRT was doing. <laughs> And for me, this is part of my PhD as well. When I'm looking at mobility as a service, I firmly believe this combination of people and goods is the way forward. And we do have COP26 coming up and we do have to start thinking cleverer and using the asset that's there and moving on to gym because for me within the phd visitors to an area particularly a national park are actually the key to unlocking some of this are they um willing and able and i've got a survey out for this willing and able to stop and take that pharmaceutical um uh, prescription to somebody who lives in a national park or in a rural area and can't actually get there or it costs them 35 pounds in a taxi ride etc so jim kindly wrote me a very lovely long email with uh, lots of information about Loch Lomond, which I completely sympathise with and recognise. And I just thought it was a great opportunity for him to share that story of what's happening and uh, if anybody can help him out. So, Jim. Uh, thanks very much. Um, yeah, lots of challenges over in the, the kind of Loch Lomond and Trossachs area. <clears throat> We've got 15,000 residents who live in the park, but we have over 7 million visitors come to the park. And it seems like most of the the kind of transport services are, you know, designed and built around providing a service to local residents and particularly any of the funding schemes. If you want to develop anything, it seems to be based on the number of residents that you that you've got. So um, there's there's some real challenges. Um, some of the, the the main gateways into the park have no bus services on a Sunday, so it's really difficult to then instigate any change in behaviour and those gateways also don't have any active travel links into you know some of the the, the, the major centres like Stirling etc so the likes of Aberfoyle calendar has no um, safe cycle routes that connect to Stirling which is a, a key origin of lots of people so the majority of those visit those seven million visitors are actually coming from the central belt of Scotland and it's really only Balloch in the National Park that has a train service coming into it. Some, 
some other services up the west side of the park, but on the east side, no, no particular services. But if you talk to all of the funding partners about you know, active travel, it's all about getting more people cycling and walking to school or to work. But a lot of people are either working from home now or commuting much greater distances than you can facilitate from some of that active travel stuff. Um, we have major issues about congestion. We've had roads closed, we've had irresponsible parking, et cetera. And, the, and this, the main solution to that seems to be build a few more car parks. But some of our areas, like you know, at the, in the heart of the Trossachs, <coughs> Loch Catron has over 500,000 vehicles per year that come in there. And they've currently got a proposal to build an additional car park with 20 places, which doesn't really seem like much of a solution. So um, uh, it was really just to kind of outline those challenges. And uh, is there anything that we can do to kind of, um, I guess, work with the key agencies? So I work quite closely with the National Park and there's four local authorities in, in that area that are obviously linked to then those service providers. We also have a mobility as a service um, system in the area, um, <clears throat> a journey planning app that was kind of instigated but it doesn't link to anything apart from really the, really those bus services, which are infrequent and actually don't run on a Sunday. So it doesn't link to any bike share, car share, DRT, which also exists in the area. Um, but as my colleagues from Killen indicated, that DRT uh, it, <clears throat> it operates in zones. So where I live in Port Amenteith, I can get the DRT two miles along the road and then I'm out with that zone. So, and it doesn't link to any other transport. So I then have to stop and book another DRT for the, the ongoing journey. So it doesn't seem terribly well implemented. And, you know, there's no real point in having that mobility as a service if it's not integrated with the, the actual underlying services. So um, that's a fairly brief whistle stop tour of the challenges I think that's faced in the, in the national park area. I won't disagree with you and I will pick up later, Jim, on the PhD stuff that I'm doing because, uh, but John Pinkard, who left half, just a wee minute ago, he's actually involved in that mass project. So if you want me to, I can I can put you in touch. But I see Matt's got his hand up. Matt. Um, I was just wondering, do you know who the service provider is for the bus routes that are there? Yeah, there's multiple service providers. So first are, are one of the service providers um, and some of those are, are are routes because they're I guess low volume routes at the moment that are actually you know commissioned by the local authority themselves so they're actually the local authority that asks for those routes to go on. Um, I, may, maybe a bit too much detail Jim and something we can maybe take offline but um, when we launched our DRT in Danoon and Campbelltown um, the way in which we did it was we replaced like an existing service um, already run by West Coast Motors um, and the way in which it was approved by the council was that because they were already required to provide a service over this like certain amount of area is we were able to just put the the technology level over the top of it. Um, so there's a number of kind of like potentially not not quick, but as in within sort of two months or so that we could actually potentially do something that might um, that might alleviate a lot of these issues, I think to hone in on your point about the different zone areas and to defend the people that are doing that is that's actually a really hard, um, that's actually a really difficult mathematical problem because what happens is when you book, if you try to go across the zones, then you don't communicate with a single vehicle, you communicate with multiple vehicles across yeah. the zones. And so the requirement effectively is that you're able to time things as they kind of leapfrog across. Um, of course, one singular zone would potentially be able to solve all of that so yeah, I'm happy to chat offline if you are um, for things that could be done in the area, I think. Yeah, the DRT, sorry, is, is principally provided so that it's the local authority. So there's four different local authorities. So in one area, Stirling, the DRT is provided by the local authority who then subcontract out to local taxi services. So there's a range of different taxi services that provide that uh, service. I'm going to start whistle stopping through all these different things. So I think we could do about three hours of chatting here. And I'm going to, oh, I always pick on Alistair at some point just to make sure that he's paying attention. Um, so he's actually put his camera on, which probably means he is paying attention at the moment because he tells me he's not a rural guru on transport, um, but he's becoming one, aren't you, Alistair? <laughs> 
Well, I can make a sort of vaguely um, relevant point about um, active travel in the Loch Lomans and Trossachs National Park, because I took, I made use of Scott Rail's new Highland Explorer carriages, which enable like 20 bikes to be carried. Um, so I took took the train up to Arakon Taba to finally get round to using the cycle route along the west side of Loch Lomond, and which I remember being opened by Tavish Scott when he was the transport minister back about 15 years ago. And I was amazed at the appalling state of the, the route. There was virtually no signage once you're in Tarbot to, to get you onto the route, even though you think it would be simple. Um, the surface was really poor. In places, the surface was worse than the, than the, the A82 in parallel. And uh, most of it is, it's all off-road and segregated, some of it beside the A82, but it does dip in and out. And there's some great... Um, former uh, for the former a82 bits where you where you've got a nice bit to cycle on but then it does dip in and out and there are not signs in the way so it it's a real missed opportunity it would seem like a good idea at the time but nobody has thought right we need to maintain this and it seems to be fallen between various stools the very the two councils involved sustrans and other organizations i'm waiting um, for george to put his hand up here because george might be able to help you out with his cycling hat on george um, I'm not really able to help out too much there. Obviously, I'm at the other end of Scotland, at the far north, and only cover the sort of Caithness and part of the Highlands for one project. Um, but I do know that this is something that's been raised uh, by other um, my colleagues with regard to the maintenance of the, the cycle pathways, etc., uh, on the Sustrans National Cycle Network. Um, it seems to be going through a little bit of a, a rejig at the moment. They're trying to look at, I believe Sustrans are trying to or trying to be encouraged to look at it and having a universal well maybe not universal but a national signposting principle so that all signs are the same and that everybody sings from the same, same hymn sheet um, but with regard to in the maintenance um, I can't shed any light on that I'm afraid. Alistair we need to make this your quest to, to sort it out. Well, I've written a column about it, um, which I'll just post in the chat. But Please. interestingly, Sastran seemed to totally wash the hands of it. It's like I say it's not a national, it's not part of the national network, um, nothing to do with us, Gov. For those of you that don't know Alistair, Alistair um, works for the Scotsman. So um, he was always looking for a nice rural story and uh, he's kindly covered quite a few of the, the things from we've discussed in cafes because obviously rural doesn't get much much coverage, does it, Alistair? And he will be featuring in a cafe in 2022, um, won't you? So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how uh, rural um, educates everybody, not just me. Um, I'm going to quickly go to Jane because I think you might all find this quite interesting. Uh, when we, Al Alex and I, did the rural part, uh, rural parliament, the Scottish Parliament actually committee session ten days ago, which was quite an overwhelming experience, it has to be said. Um, we mentioned about the North Coast, or I did, the North Coast 500 and how you can't actually do this by public transport without having a glitch along the way. I think Jane must have been listening to pick up on that one, or she uh, was listening to the many times I've mentioned Michael Wilmot's uh, travel round the North Coast 500. So I want to introduce Jane because she'll explain the glitch, but Jane is also very good at highlighting, as she has done in the chat, how things can happen informally in communities, which is the main main thing I would say about rural is that we find a way to make things happen and it doesn't need to necessarily have tech. If there's a will, there's a way. And I think that's a challenge that every country has, whether you're Germany, France, the UK, Scotland, is how do you formalise these informal to recognise that people have gone out their way to go and collect flowers on their way back from a journey to bring to church um, or to bring to whichever location it's going to be. So Jane, over to you. Okay, sorry. All right. I'm just about to talk here. All right, okay. okay. Sorry, that my husband's just <laughs> talking about a delivery that's just come around. Well, where we are, tech isn't any use really because we don't have a good signal. I can't even send a text from my house because my phone doesn't have a good signal. So uh, we have a terrific dial-a-bus service, but when they 
the the Highland Council introduced it many many years ago, and it it came over from what was called the disabled taxi, so it wasn't immediately recognised, and it operated for about four years without anybody realising it was a dial bus. However, now it works it works quite well so long as we can get so long as we can phone the the the, the driver the night before he will come right to the door and take us right to where we want to go but he still hasn't quite got the concept that he's to try and fit more people in if he can he's still operating more like a taxi but he will connect with our community bus which is great because highland council have given us this facility which i'm very grateful for but it just operates in the parish and so a lot of our elderly clients they want to go to alipool which is about 40 miles away in order to get to a supermarket and that's what we pr provide with our community transport anyway i realize i haven't spoken about nc 500 yet <laughs> sorry about that but um we used to be able to do it by high, by uh, public transport anti-clockwise only because there was a bike bus. Perhaps it was introduced too early. There was a bike bus that went from Inverness to Loch Inver um, and then up to Durness. And then it was withdrawn, probably because maybe lack of marketing or lack of use or something like that. And we did have people from America who did the trip anti-clockwise and just picked up things on the way and sent them home by mail and that sort of thing. But it's just impossible now to do that. And even a three hour journey by car from us to Caithness takes over seven hours by public transport. We, we used to have a really good train connection with the post bus, uh, but now we, we don't have any train connection at all. The train goes through Laird, and if we want to get the train now, we can get two buses to Alapool, uh, and then we can pick up a train in Garve, and that's our communications. <laughs> Are you muted? Why does it keep muting me? I have no idea. I don't touch anything. I obviously don't say enough, quick enough. Um, these are things that we need to be sorting out because particularly COP26, we're going to have the National Transport Strategy Review in Scotland as well. It's how, why is this, this possible? Why are we still encouraging all these cars and you pick up a motorsport magazine or motoring magazine, classic car magazine, which my husband does and plunks it in front of me and says, here's them advertising to go and do the North Coast 500. And then you speak to cyclists and it's we're pushing people onto roads that are not fit for purpose. So there is a there is a big argument here that, yes, we want tourism and then Jean will probably back me up on this. I know people that run businesses all throughout the North Coast 500 that 10 years ago they retired in inverted commas to be running a business from April to October. Now they're expected to be running it 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. Now you can put up the word closed, obviously, that's your choice, but then that actually nurtures a whole different um, ethos of, well, they're not open, so I won't look at them next time I'm back. So there's a whole load of different pressures that by pushing people onto not just the North Coast 500. I think I read, and Alistair, don't quote me on this, 20 years ago, I think we had 10 official routes for like visitors or us to go and travel on. It's now 30 that we've gone and, and actually put road signs on to encourage people, and I can't find the stat, but I can if you need it, to go in their cars and go and do these routes. Why? I know, and we don't have... Um... Uh, electric well we have we do have I think three electric plugs that we people can plug in but because it hasn't been um, standardized yet I think a lot of the electric vehicles yep. maybe can't can't even use use them yet yeah and of course if, can... if somebody plugs in overnight that's that's a whole it's gone for anyone else because it's it'll be the slow one it's not a high speed one if, if, if I could come in quickly on your point, Jane, about getting the train from Garve, 
I was staying in Ackleton Bui and looking to have to work from an office in Inverness. So I looked at the train times and it seems there's either a train at eight o'clock in the morning or the next one's at two o'clock in the afternoon. Yes, they don't connect. They don't connect very well. But I, I think I think I did manage to get a bus from Alipur once and it was five minutes. I managed to run from the bus stop to the train station. But the interesting thing is that the bus stop is not at the train station which would be <laughs> helpful, you know, that would be helpful. Now, I'm conscious we're running out of time and it's two people we still, I promise that we'd speak to. Uh, David, would you like to just introduce yourself because you are new to post and you will be attending every SRITC Cafe Forward and uh, particularly in your role as CTA, it's important that everybody gets to meet you. Yeah, thanks Jenny. Um, yeah, I'll just briefly introduce myself. Um, I started uh, as the new director for Scotland at CTA um, couple of weeks ago and um, so still very fresh in post um, my previous role was policy public affairs and research at the Scottish Council for Development and Industry um, which is another membership organization and think tank um, that represents kind of all sectors of the Scottish economy so um, a much more kind of generalist role than the one I've come into um, so doing everything I can to um, learn as much as I can about the um, community transport sector um, and um, kind of understand all of the um, niche and specific um, challenges and opportunities kind of in the sector um, so lots of kind of exciting and interesting stuff that we're having I think about and planning for 2022 that I'm sure I'll come back to this group um, to either Get some of your input or or discuss with you um, at some stage um but particularly i think interested in a lot of what we're talking about today in terms of connectivity but also how that connects to sustainability so i think there's cta seems to have been good in the past at speaking um to itself or within um some of the niche parts of the sector but maybe less good at, at kind of being um, an advocate and a bit evangelical about the sector in broader policy conversations um talking about um, not just transport, but um, health and well-being and the economy and the transition to net zero. Um, so I think that's one of the things I'm keen to do is how do we kind of collectively amplify our voice with all of yours um, to underline what our kind of role is in doing that. Because as has been said, you know, if we're expecting people in, in rural areas, for example, to rely on cars, um, that's not a solution either to the connectivity problem or to the sustainability problem. Um, so happy to connect and meet with anyone on this call that is interested either in our work or connecting um, afterwards, but good to, to hear the conversation today. Well, welcome. And I'm sure you won't be a stranger to the cafes or any of the work of SRITC going forward. And I'm not leaving the last to the last, but I am. Liz. Liz is being kindly in the wings and the gathering and things. And it links very well with what David was saying, because she doesn't have a car and she couldn't get access to having a bit of a social after the gathering. So uh, she's also up in the Murray area. And, and I know Donald was keen to get to meet uh, other car sharing organisations and Donald I can't guarantee they all turn up, but some have turned up and some will turn up and I can facilitate that for you. But Liz um, is slightly different geography area, but she can give you her story. Liz. Hi, folks. And Jenny, thanks very much for the opportunity. Can you all hear me properly? Yeah, good. Um, well, uh, I'm involved with a, a community minibus, um, which was set up to facilitate um, transport to our local uh, surgery in Lossiemouth. I live in Burghead and along the coast there are communities uh, where the, um, the health service shut down the surgeries uh, because they're not suitable uh, during the pandemic. Normally uh, a trip to the surgery in Lossiemouth involves a journey by stagecoach bus from uh, wherever, Burghead to Elgin, then Elgin to Lossiemouth. This can be an extremely stressful journey. I've done it many times myself. You're dealing with uh, buses that don't turn up, buses that are late. The stress is unbelievable. And now that journey can take a minimum of two hours to get to your appointment. Um, so uh, what we did was we set up, there was a, a minibus available in Hopeman. Um, and it was not very well used. So within a few weeks of uh, the situation developing, we had the bus up and running with volunteer drivers taking people from door to door. 
from their door to the surgery in Lossy Mouth. And I've had to use it a few times and it is a wonderful service. But as I say, it's run by volunteers and we have to fund ourselves. <clears throat> So it's, it's not at all easy. There is a Murray Dial a bus. Unfortunately, it's only for those who um, do not live on a bus route. So we can't avail ourselves of that. Um, oh, there is a Murray car share scheme. Um, hopefully we'll be able to look into that. But I'm really, really um, delighted to hear about, um, what was the name of that app? It was at Scoot. Uh, Greg, I think that's you. brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So I'll be looking at that. So anything that's going to help. Um, but one of one of our worries now with the, with the bus service that we're trying to provide is that a lot of our drivers have gone back to work and are no longer available. So we're having a struggle to um, recruit drivers, and of course they are volunteers. Another thing I think hampers us too is the fact that people don't know enough about us. So Alistair, Scotsman, mm -hmm. uh, a wee article <laughs> wouldn't go amiss. <laughs> um, you know, we need we need to up our game as, as far as that um, that's concerned, but we are having a meeting next Tuesday night and hopefully we can address these issues. Oh, fab. Um, I always think these cafes, when we have them open and we have no particular agenda, are really good because it's a great way for people to meet aside from anything else and we're sharing. And somebody did say to me yesterday, aren't we just having the same conversation we had 20 years ago? And we're not. The way we may have some of the similar challenges getting people from A to B, but the technology, the information, the expectations, the destinations, so much of it has changed. And I think these these are really important sessions to be able to make sure that we don't feel isolated and that I can moan about my DRT to somebody who actually understands what I'm talking about, but also that we can make things happen and change and Donald sitting there I'm keep picking on you Donald but you want to meet other people of like minded um, and to be able to help support and that's what SRITC is about so I'm really grateful that you've you've all joined us this morning um, Amelia's going to say something before I put a PowerPoint up for just finishing off go on Amelia sorry I just wanted to say firstly thank you for having me on this this is my first breakfast meeting but um, firstly for me like this is a huge educational piece because I didn't even know like the beginnings of the struggles that you guys have. I have a train that comes near us. I complained the other day because my train arrived. I think it was like three minutes late, but there was still a train I could get on. I didn't realize how bad it was in rural areas, but I just wanted to add, because Greg forgot to say as well about Scoot, um, we plant a tree as well for every drive you complete on the platform um, and errands as well. So you're 110% carbon negative. Um, so your carbon, uh, we're partnered with the Eden uh, replantation project um, who are helping us. Uh, we've got a campaign running at the moment to plant uh, 1 million trees. Um, so yeah, that's what's happening at the moment. Fab, is thank you to, to Amelia and Greg for coming along today. Um, I, I thought you'd find it useful, but I knew we'd find it useful as well, hearing about what you guys are up to. So I know it's been run over a couple of minutes, um, but just a quick one. We are running uh, the last cafe of the year. I don't do December because everybody's too busy. Uh, and if I could do it, I would do wine and cheese so we could meet together or <laughs> something like that. But we will all meet together in September next year, which is why we're trying to make it a bit more of an experience to give ourselves more time to have that show social and get to actually meet each other in the flesh and I'll be hugging so many of you I don't care what Nicola Sturgeon says because I've seen you all um, and I want to hug you anyway November um, we are Suzanne who you may have remembered from the gathering and um, from Cycling Scotland is helping jointly host the cafe and she's called it urban hogwash or rural reality what's needed to make active travel accessibility and accessible and we're continuing the theme forward from the gathering realistic and affordable so we'll have Living Street Scotland coming along, Ramblers uh, Scotland and Cycling UK. And bizarrely, for those of you that know me, and Amelia might appreciate this, I did suggest at some point we should have the British Horse Society come along because horses are very much still part of the rural area and it's about accessibility to pathways or bridleways in other, in other areas. Just a reminder about the, the two job opportunities. As I say, uh, Alex has kindly put the bits and pieces in the chat. Um, four to eight hours 
at a guess at the moment it's not going to be a full-time job or a full-time part-time job and um, I am going to COP26 so I'll be there as an official observer which is scaring the hell out of me at the moment doing all the paperwork that I need to do and you wouldn't realize you don't want to know and um, so I will be as I was told yesterday rubbing shoulders with presidents and prime ministers so if there's anything in particular that you want from COP26 or you want to hear about or you want me to go and see then drop me an email but I will give you a debrief on that uh, in in November um, so the last thing to say is really have a good weekend uh, keep in touch keep chatting keep smiling and um, I really look forward to seeing you guys in November and more, more importantly I'm wishing away the time but in Aviemore area next year so thanks very much and I think some of you know to stay on so uh, that's my musketeers if they can stay on Ali, Matt, Alex and there's one or two others of you so thank you very much have a good weekend bye